let's kick things off. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us online today for CESA's Research in Action webinar. My name is Lizzie Lowe, and I lead the extension team here at CESA. And we've got four brilliant speakers online today um, to give you some presentations. Now, you've probably heard of the agricultural work that CESA does. Our little motto is a thriving world through science and education. And we actually do a lot more than agriculture. We do a lot of conservation work and we're also doing some work in, in urban biodiversities in cities. And so what we wanted to do today was rather than focusing just on our agricultural work, we'll cover a little bit of that, but we also wanted to give you guys a bit of a um, an overview of some of the other really exciting work that we're doing at CESAR at the moment, which takes in um, conservation and, um, and biodiversity research as well. So just a little bit of housekeeping. This is a webinar today. So um, it will be available for viewing later on YouTube. It does mean that you're not able to show your videos or um, audio, but you are able to submit questions by the Q&A and we can answer them at the very end of the webinar. We'll also be sharing some resources via the chat function, which you'll be able to access throughout the sessions. So uh, our speakers today, we have four speakers from CESAR Australia. Lily is going to be kicking things off talking about our beneficial toxicity table. Then we have a presentation from Alex, who's a research scientist, and he's going to be talking about a new tool that he's developed for tracking of uh, moths using wind forecasting data. Uh, then we then have Peter, who is another research scientist from CESAR Australia, talking about the genetic work that he's done with native species management. And finally, uh, Lewis, who's our research lead, who's going to be talking about some BioBlitz research that they did in Melbourne recently and how this can contribute to biodiversity knowledge. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and I'll hand right over to Lilia. Cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Just let me bring up my slides. Right, perfect. So, yes, like Lizzie said, I'm going to be chatting today about preserving beneficial insects in broad acre crops, which encompasses quite a bit of work that we're doing here at CESAR. So hopefully you've all heard of beneficial insects before, um, but just to give you an idea of the huge diversity present in Australia, just here's a couple of photos that I wanted to share. And we really have a great range of insects from snout mites to rove beetles to parasoid wasps in our cropping systems. And just why do we actually care about beneficial insects? Well, they their significance lies in their ability to help suppress pest populations without resorting to the need for chemical interventions. And um, this helps aid in um, addressing insecticide resistance concerns and also avoids a lot of the regulatory issues that we have around chemical use. Um, and existing and introduced beneficial species offer really diverse solutions to pest problems. So you have generalist predators like ladybirds to really specialized um, predators like parasitoids. And this natural pest control approach holds really immense global value and it's estimated at tens of billions of dollars annually. So while insecticides are a really valuable tool for pest management, they can really harm beneficial insect populations, especially the broad spectrum ones like synthetic pyrethroids, organophosphates and carbamates. So there's a lot of direct impacts through mortality, indirect impacts such as changes in sex ratio or reduced reproductive capacity. And then there are also impacts at a population or community level. And this leads to a loss of natural pest control, which can trigger a heap of secondary issues within the ecosystem like secondary pest outbreaks. So we know that growers can promote the pest suppression abilities of these beneficial insects by adopting management practices that support and maintain their populations. And this is really acknowledged in areas like horticulture and cotton where they have a lot of resources and support available. But applying these methods in the grain sector has always been a lot more difficult um, and a part of that is due to the lack of some sort of integrated but scientifically proven guide that can support these practices. And this is where the Australians Grains Pest Innovation Program comes in. So this is a collaborative effort between CESAR Australia, the University of Melbourne, um, and it's supported by GRDC. So there are a lot of studies out there that actually examine the impact of pesticides on natural enemies, but how much of that actually applied to the grains industry was sort of up in the air. So what we did was we did some research tailored to local needs and involving industry input, and it assessed local and relevant chemicals, rates, environments, pests, and beneficials in the context of the Australian grain industry. 
So this involved a lot of literature reviews into the toxicity of pesticides registered for use in grains or natural enemies. And it was also complemented by a lot of extensive research by a number of AgPIP scientists. And this was particularly important for products that had been marked as selective or soft, as we wanted to know exactly what species of natural enemies that they were selective on. And this was the outcome, which hopefully you've all seen online before. And it's basically a matrix that has the beneficial groups on the top and the active ingredients on the side. And it compiles really diverse data and it generates an overall toxicity rating for each chemical against each beneficial group. And these ratings were derived from an average outcome across chemicals and species, descended from least to most toxic. So the low impact ones are the ones shaded in green, the moderate ones are in yellow, high impact chemicals are in orange, and then the really high impact chemicals are red. And then the ones where they have the split rating um, shown by that diagonal slash, that's where there's quite a large range. And we see a couple of trends show through here. So a lot of the soft chemicals, which are the ones up the top, did actually show a minimal mortality rate, um, including like flunicamide and aphidopyropin, and as well as bioinsecticides like BC or NPV. And this is a really good finding. It offers a lot of relief to growers because it indicates that these softer chemicals do pose a lower risk in general. Um, and then we also see that a certain number of species do show a notable tolerance to various active ingredients. And this included things like growth beetles or hoverflies or spiders. And these findings suggest that such beneficials could persist in a crop, especially when it's being treated with milder insecticides, which is really promising for IPM programs and merging biological and chemical control. Because if growers and advisors are careful in their selection of active ingredients, you can still use these insecticides in a smart way and preserve your beneficial insects. But despite these positive outcomes, there were also some unexpected results um, that do have some influence on beneficials management, and that's where we want to be really careful. So for the first example, despite being frequently um, promoted as a selective insecticide, pyrimicarb was actually quite toxic to a range of beneficial species. Most striking was its really high toxicity to a couple of parasitoid wasp species, even at rates that were well below the field level. And these parasitoids are really key players for the grains industry because they help control aphids, um, which are obviously a major pest that we deal with. And so, you know, using pyrimicarb then actually contradicts the IPM strategies, which is just undermining your whole system then. But in contrast, uh, like I said, flunicamid and aphidopyropin, which are new recently introduced pesticides to the Australian market, showed much lower toxicity in comparison. Um, so these actually help control these insects a little bit better whilst enabling local parasitoid populations to continue parasitizing. And then as a second example, we have snout mites. So traditionally red-legged earth mites have been controlled with organophosphates and synthetic pyrethroids in the field. But unfortunately, this has led to quite a lot of resistance in Southern agricultural areas in particular. And so where resistance is present, control could potentially still be achieved through biological control with predatory mites, which helps sort of skirt those resistant issues. Um, and the use of diaphenthurion has been suggested as a softer pesticide for use in these IPM systems. But although advertised, again, as a safe option for beneficial insects, including predatory mites, uh, this chemical actually proved to be really highly toxic to snout mites in our findings. And again, this suggests that it's not suitable to an IPM strategy for red legs. And this really underscores the need of for really diverse species trials and being careful when you're looking at something that's described as selective um, and just really highlights the challenge of ecological balance without comprehensive assessments. So I've thrown a lot of information at you all, um, but what does that actually mean for you all at the field? Well, firstly, it obviously underscores the need to avoid those broad spectrum and prophylactic sprays where possible in order to maintain those local beneficial populations that are doing a lot of work in the field for you. Um, and if you're actively observing your field's insects, the table can be really useful to help you guide your spraying decisions because you can make really targeted um, decisions in the future. So you can minimize harm to beneficial insects whilst boosting your biological pest control. 
So like for instance, if you've got a lot of green peach aphid in your field, um, but you're noting signs of parasitism, you can then choose a the uh, pesticide that has a safer chemical rating for parasitoids. And then in situations where beneficial monitoring isn't quite feasible for you, you're still able to identify pesticides that have a low overall toxicity rating. Um, so you're still keeping those really hardy generalist predators like the road beetles or the hoverflies. So selecting the right chemicals is really crucial for strong integrated pest management. Um, and it enables effective pest control whilst protecting those beneficial insects and ultimately reducing res resistance, resistance risk. And overall, these strategies contribute to the enduring sustainability of chemical solutions. So what's next for this toxicity table? Our future endeavours include branching out into the lab, um, out of the lab and into semi-field and field trials, looking at seed treatments and looking past direct mortality and into sublethal effects. And then one of our biggest endeavours in extension is making sure that the information is accessible and actually usable by you growers. So currently you can access the information via the table on the website, but we're also currently integrating it into our new website, AgPest, which will be a comprehensive pest management build, um, which you can see an example of here. So keep an eye out for that one in the future. So just a big thanks to all of our partners and support at the University of Melbourne and GRDC and all of the researchers who have put a lot of time and work into this project. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lilia. And you can access the beneficial toxicity table through the link that I put into the chat as well. Okay, moving from um, pure kind of agricultural management research into some research which spans both agricultural and um, and conservation research. And Alex is now going to be sharing his work on wind dispersal. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about some uh, pretty cool work we've uh, done here at Caesar uh, on how we can use uh, wind and modeling wind speed and direction to understand movements of insects and its implications for management of both native and introduced uh, species of moths. So insect migration is a field that has uh, really undergone quite a bit of a surge in research in recent years. Uh, maybe the best known uh, case of insect migration is uh, the massive migration of monarch butterflies in North America. But actually, there are billions of insects that migrate uh, throughout the world, including in Australia. And the more research has been done, the more we know that tailwinds are a really important contributing factor. So uh, the way that insects get, get really impressive speeds while flying and migrating, unlike birds, is by using winds that blow in favorable uh, directions. And so this uh, gives us a really cool opportunity uh, to predict the movements of insects by using wind and modeling where winds are going to carry insects. And we've done this here in Caesar for uh, two different species of uh, noctuid moths, which is a pretty big family of moths. And they're very important in Australia for two main reasons. One is that some species are really significant agricultural pests. These are what uh, we call cutworms and armyworms. But also we have a native species bogong moths, which is endangered. And both of these uh, species, like all other noctuid moths, are really good uh, species to use wind modeling for because the adults fly at night and cover really large distances. So if we know when they fly and we know that they use wind, then potentially we can identify where they fly to and where they fly from by modeling uh, the direction of wind. So we started this work with working on fall armyworm, which is a really significant agricultural pest. Uh, they, the uh, larvae feed on a lot of different hosts, some of them very commercially important, like uh, maize, rice, sorghum, sugarcane, and wheat. But overall, their host range includes over 350 different plants. So they can also survive outside of agricultural fields. And uh, the this species is not native to Australia. It was first recorded in the Torres Straits in uh, January 2020, but now it occurs widely throughout northern Australia, where it is established and occurs there year 
uh, all uh, all around the year. Um, but uh, uh, these moths can actually migrate further south into Australia, in Australia, into uh, larger agricultural regions during warmer months. So during the winter, they will not persist in Victoria and New South Wales, but they can get all the way down south here when uh, the temperature is a bit more to their liking. And as far as we know, they use winds to uh, move these, uh, to make these migrations uh, further south in Australia. So given that they have this uh, capacity to spread really rapidly, we wanted to see if we can use wind to predict where moths will show up and also to identify where they come from so we can identify which are the really important regions that contribute to this uh, uh, to these migrations. So that way we could use wind to provide an early warning system for pest management because we can use wind forecasts to say there is a, an actual uh, high risk of moths appearing in any given area uh, at any uh, given time. So with an investment from Plant Health Australia, we developed this online tool, which is uh, available on the CSER website, which allows uh, users to run these forecasts uh, using uh, wind forecast data and see where the winds are likely to carry, um, to carry these moths. So one question you might have is, well, I don't know where the moths are. What should I do then? Well, we have a function in the tool which uses uh, which uh, runs these simulations from um, known populations of moths in no northern Australia. Each star is a known population. And so when you click the button to run the simulation, it tells you overnight where winds could have carried the moths from these known populations. So this can give you a warning if the, over the last night the winds were favorable to bring moths to your area, as we see in this uh, example here. Probably not because the, the winds carried most of the moths out to sea. But on a different day, or for instance, in this easternmost population, we actually see this plume leading down south, which means that from that population, overnight, winds could have carried moths down further south into Queensland. And this gives you a really good early warning system. The other way you can use this is you can also run these simulations backwards. So instead of saying where the winds are going to carry uh, moths, you can say, well, where have the winds brought the moths from? So if you, for instance, identified a new population of moths, for an example, say it's right here where this red star is, then you can use this model to see where uh, these moths are likely to have come from. So for instance, for this example here, the winds would have, uh, would have come from a southerly direction. So if you identified moths here, then their most likely origin would have been south of where you are right now. So this really gives uh, growers and agronomists this tool that they can use to try and understand where these invasive species have come from and also where they are likely to come. And early warnings are really important for pest management because they can allow you to target your uh, monitoring uh, resources and also your management resources more effectively uh, if you have a bit of an idea of when might be the best time to use these other techniques. The other uh, really cool species we've used wind modeling for is bogong moth. So the bogong moth is an annual, as a, a native species in Australia that undergoes this really remarkable annual migration. Uh, the larvae of the moth develop in the lowlands uh, in winter in uh, Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland. Um, but then during the spring, the adults actually fly uh, over to uh, the Australian Alps where they will spend their summer uh, in rock crevices before then the next year uh, in autumn flying back uh, back to the lowlands where the larvae grow. So every year we have this migration uh, taking place. And uh, these moths have been in the news recently because they have uh, only a few years ago been assigned the status of endangered because of really large collapses of the populations in the Australian Alps. Um, and so there's a really strong conser uh, conservation need to understand better why these populations are collapsing, which may be tied to conditions in their uh, uh, winter breeding grounds. But then that means we need to understand where exactly they are coming from. So while we have this broad general idea of where the bogong moths occur, we don't know exactly where the 
alpine populations are coming from. So the Bogom moths arrive in the Australian Alps, so we want to have a better idea of where they come from and also how they get there because they're, the way they navigate to the mountains is also not really well understood yet. So we would like to identify these source populations for the, for the moths that we find in the Australian Alps so we can then enact some conservation measures and help uh, sustain the moth populations. So we have uh, a lot of uh, um, records of moth larvae throughout Victoria and New South Wales and uh, uh, in the lowlands, which we have divided into these three generally broad ranges. Uh, uh, gre the green is Western Victoria, the blue is Southern New South Wales, and the red is Central New South Wales. And we want to see if wind can carry moths from these uh, regions into the Australian Alps. And especially we want to know if wind is enough on its own, or is there some other navigational tool that they uh, that they use? Well, it turns out wind is enough. So all of these red dots basically show the results of simulations. So for each night during the uh, the spring of 2019, when northerlies are blowing from those uh, regions, this shows where the winds are traveling. So as you can see, sometimes you can start going on a northerly and then it'll end up actually taking you back north instead of down to the Alps. But for a lot of these nights, the conditions are suitable to take the moths all the way to the Alps from their breeding grounds in one single night's flight. So just using wind can be alone, it can alone be sufficient to bring all of these moths to the Australian Alps. The other important thing here is that all three regions contribute to the populations in the Australian Alps. These moths can come from anywhere in this really uh, wide band of uh, potential source populations. So if we actually look at what the, the story of the moth migration looks like, it's something like this, where they travel from a lot of different places to the Australian Alps. So you have this mixing of moths from different areas, but still most of the Australian Alps, the largest contribution comes from Southern New South Wales which incidentally is an agricultural area that's been hit pretty heavily by uh, by uh, uh, droughts during the, the last few years, which might explain why we saw these population crashes. So overall, we have this really powerful tool for insect monitoring with this wind-assisted dispersal model. We can use the, our models to predict where insects are going to disperse to, which has really strong implications for agriculture and pest management because we have an early warning system for when pests might arrive in our uh, growing regions, but also for conservation, because if we can identify where these uh, migrating moths are coming from, then we can enact conservation measures in those particular areas to sustain their breeding populations and prevent further population uh, declines and crashes. Um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Alex. And as before, we've got the link there for you to find out more about Alex's work and access that um, full armyware migrational tool. Um, our next speaker, Peter, uh, is going to give us uh, a, an overview of some of the conservation and genetics work that we're doing at CESAR at the moment. So I'll hand over to you, Peter. Terrific. Thanks, Lizzie, and welcome to everybody. I'll just share my screen here as well. There we go. Um, so a lot of what we do at CESA tries to look at the, the, the intersection between agriculture and, and our natural environment. Um, so we have a, a significant focus on conservation as well. And regrettably, these days, too many of our native species are in real trouble. Our native wildlife is in real trouble. So I wanted to highlight that with a familiar example, that of the koala. So the threats to koalas, are, a lot of them are, are well known, um, but there are increasingly issues re relating to global warming. So in addition to the problems that we've had from from habitat clearing um, and road accidents, a lot of koalas end up being hit by cars, um, bushfires, but increasingly um, their food trees are becoming stressed. So if, if their food trees are stressed, 
koalas are not able to get enough nutrition or moisture from their diet and so they end up being stressed themselves and when they're run down they become a lot more susceptible to recently introduced diseases so they for, for some time struggled with um, or faced challenges from chlamydia and also re more recently a, a, a retrovirus that's been introduced to the population so healthy populations are able to cope to a reasonable extent with these pathogens but when they're under stress the um, problems that koalas face um, sort of mount up exponentially so here's um, a map showing what was the distribution of koalas even five years ago and just in the last few years there's been a really catastrophic decline particularly in the north and inland populations and there was a very particularly sad example um, from Gunadar in New South Wales which had had a very strong and healthy population um, that had been the, the subject of uh, a lot of research because they thought there was a, a bit of an exception with this population in Gunadar, but recently it's um, collapsed as well and it's now been declared functionally extinct. The few koalas that remain there are now old and have become infertile because of um, the chlamydia infection. Um, and there's thought to be less concern for the koalas in the south. So the koalas in Queensland and New South Wales are listed as vulnerable under the EPBC Act. Koalas in South Australia are largely um, introduced in Kangaroo Island and around Adelaide. And in Victoria, um, in some areas of Victoria, we have an abundance of koalas just locally. So these are the records of koalas from Victoria going back to the 1960s. But in fact, koalas were pretty much wiped out in Victoria in the, in the 19, 1880s. And there was a, a small remnant population that had been moved to French Island. And nearly all of the koalas in Victoria are actually reintroduced from this small population that remained on French Island. It turns out there were likely a few that persisted within the Streslecki ranges as well. But overall, the koalas within Victoria are very much lacking in genetic diversity. And the koalas in the northern populations in Queensland and New South Wales actually have a lot more genetic diversity. And it's the genetic diversity within species that gives the resilience to future change. So it's likely that within the broader population in the north, there is more potential for disease resistance and desiccation and, and heat tolerance resistance than there is in the south. So with koalas, we, we know a little bit about that just from the demographic history of, of the species that people have recorded what's happened to them. But for most things, we rely on genetic data to be able to tell us that story. So we've used genetic data in conservation for some decades now. Um, and We've been able to, th through um, a handful of uh, genetic markers that have been developed for specific species, we've been able to look at and get a picture of the population structure, how different, um, how differentiated individuals are within subpopulations, the extent of the genetic diversity or the relative genetic diversity across different subpopulations, and the extent of inbreeding that occurs across different subpopulations or within the population as a whole. And so it's in, it's crucial to know this information for the management of the species. You know, if there's really lacking in genetic diversity in one area, then we may be able to translocate individuals or, or reconnect patches of habitat to restore the connectivity and, the, and therefore restore the genetic health of those populations. And we know that if populations become too small, they become subject to inbreeding depression and they can become um, very unhealthy very quickly in that, if that's the case. If we get just down to a handful of ind individuals that are reproducing, those, those populations can, can suffer from all kinds of defects, you know, skeletal defects and, and heart deficiencies and things like that. And they become very um, prone to, to local extinction very quickly when, when that's occurring. So we've been able to do all those things, but 
in recent years, the costs of genetic sequencing, DNA sequencing have fallen very dramatically. Um, and that now enables us to obtain far more genetic markers than we were able to in the past. So by um, reducing the uh, running reduced representation sequencing, so we don't need to sequence the entire genome for every individual, we can just sequence a proportion of the genome that could give us thousands, even tens of thousands of genetic markers, what we call SNPs. So on the on the left there is a, is a bit of a diagram. So amongst all of the DNA sequence that we have within our genome or within an organism's genome, there will be a few positions where it, it's likely to be variable. We call that a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. And so that um, then enables us to do a lot more than what we've been able to do in the past. In addition to that, um, advances in recent years in, in genome sequencing and the assemblies that we're able to get from genome sequencing have advanced significantly as well. So you may have heard of the, the Human Genome Project, which was which announced the um, a human genome sequence over 20 years ago now, but it was really only last year that they were able to put together a very detailed human genome, which which was which we now consider a, a complete assembly rather than a, just a draft assembly. So genetic data can now tell us a lot of things that we were not, and answer a lot of questions that we were not able to really answer adequately in the past. We now have a much clearer picture of the population structure for organisms. We can now look at the level of relatedness amongst individuals within populations. So if we're looking at trying to manage the breeding or the, 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 the crossing of individuals in captive or wild populations, we need to know whether those individuals are related. We can now assign the sex to individuals where, where um, we may not be able to have known that in the past. So for a lot of wild species, it's it's not easy to tell whether it's, it's a male or a female. We can now um, genotype individuals just from environmental samples, from hair or from scats or some feathers. So for a lot of organisms, that means we don't have to actually go out and capture the organism, which can be very stressful. We can do it from environmental samples. We can now get evidence of hybridization between different species or related species. And we're increasingly being able to assess the, the effective population size, which is crucially important. And we can increasingly look at evidence for adaptive variation. So evidence whether particular populations may be more resistant to heat or climate disturbance or to or particular pathogens that are introduced. So here are some of the organisms or the animals that CEDA has been working on over the last few years. And for a lot of these things, we don't have the demographic history that we do have for koalas. So um, mountain pygmy possums that occur up in the Alps and largely feed on the bogong moths that Alex was just talking about. Eastern bristle bird, which now has very small populations remaining. Brush-tailed rock wallabies, which are almost extinct in Victoria. There's just one tiny remnant population left in East Gippsland. Um, the spot-tail quoll, which has been reduced to very small numbers and on the mainland of Australia. Um, the platypus, our iconic animal, which, which Caesar has been studying for many years now. And the eastern barred bandicoot. And with a lot of these things, it's not all bad news. And this is it, for the eastern barred bandicoot in particular, it is now making a comeback. And it's, this is a species that had been declared extinct in the wild on, on the mainland. There had been a very small population that had been discovered in um, Hamilton in um, Western Victoria. And this species is, is very, very vulnerable to predation by foxes. So they were able to rescue this last wild population from the tip near Hamilton before the foxes got them and they took them into captivity, but they were extremely lucky in genetic diversity. But Caesar has been able to advise on crossing of the captive animals from um, that remained from Victoria. We've crossed them or they've been able to be crossed with a small number of individuals from Tasmania where the species still persists. And that's restored the genetic health of the Victorian population. And they've now been able to be successfully reintroduced at a number of sites around Victoria. So at Phillip Island, where they've, they've been able to eliminate foxes, 
Um, Eastern Bard bandicoots are now thriving and also within conservation reserves at Mount Rothwell um, and Tiverton in Western Victoria. So we're proud to have been involved in a number of these um, studies that are informing the management of these species and, and it, certainly, at least in some cases, are, are, are seeing um, a recovery and a turnaround in their fortunes. So thank you. Um, if, uh, if anyone has any questions about any of the projects that we have spoken about today or any of other CESAR's projects, um, you can get in contact with us at info at CESARAustralia.com. Um, unfortunately, our final speaker is not going to be able to join us today. He's been pulled away, but we will definitely get him to record a separate um, uh, little summary of his work that we can put up on YouTube at a later date. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today.